Hello and welcome to lecture number four in our course Introduction to Data Analysis with R. My goal today is to bring everything we learned so far together so we can solidify our understanding of data wrangling in the tidyverse. If all goes according to plan, we will then have more mental capacity freed up for the statistics starting next week and we can use our understanding of data to experiment and play around with these statistical concepts. And hopefully we also won't get stuck too much on this data wrangling stuff when we do the statistics. This means that today's exercises might be the most challenging so far, because while well, everything you learn so far will in some one way or another be relevant. Even if it just means choosing what to use and what not to use. As you might be able to tell, mental models are one of my favorite topics. We started teasing one of those last lecture and we talked about iteration. So I want to actually go back to this and talk a bit more about iteration. So without further ado, let's jump straight into RStudio. So what I have set up here is in the RStudio project I'm using for the course, just a fresh R markdown document with all the example text still in there. So let me delete this. So iteration. Iteration is the basic idea of doing one thing multiple times or for multiple things. It is an area where computers shine. So in this chapter, we will learn how to fully utilize the power at our fingertips. We had first encountered iteration in a very implicit form. When we use R's basic mass operators, like for example, we have a vector one to um, three, and we add it to, oh, let's choose one to three again. If we add this, what R does is it adds the first element of the first vector to the first element of the second vector and so forth. So this operation is vectorized without us having to tell R to do so. Um, notice how it looks like all the operations happen at the same time, but this just looks like it because computers are really fast at adding numbers one after the other. This iteration in this case happens in another programming language, which is a bit closer to the way computers think, and that's because it is a bit less fun to write for humans. So we have the luxury of just using R, which is fun for humans, and then R does the computer stuff for us. For this whole idea of iteration, there are two schools of thought. And I will just use a real world example to talk about this. And what we will do is we will read in multiple files. First, we choose the functional programming approach. Um, you might remember the Gapminder dataset. And if I go into my project folder, I have the data here, but this time we weren't sent the full dataset. We were sent one dataset for each continent. So what we want to do is import all the data and combine it into one dataset. I usually load the tidyverse first. So we have all the tools that we need to do just that. And we don't need this message. And this also reminds me, we will probably not want this message in our output. So I set message equals false and warning equals false for all the code chunks in our output document. Now we already know how to read in one file using read underscore CSV. So we give it the pass data and let's choose Africa. And there we have it. And now what we want to do is do this thing for all these five files. And in this idea of functional programming, for which we will use the error package, in this school of thought, what we would now do is we take another function 
that takes a vector or a list with a bunch of elements and a function and it applies this function to all the elements. In mathematics, the relation between a set of inputs and a set of outputs, which is the generalized form of a function, is called a map. And this is the reason the functions in Perl, which take a vector, a set of input, and a function, and produce this set of outputs, are called map functions. So, what we want to do is first we need to create our set of inputs. And what we want is the pass to the files. So we can use the function dir or directory to list the contents of this directory. And now if I look at the pass, this is what we have. Or it's only the contents. We want the complete pass to the individual files. So we say full names equals true. And now we have five file parts. We can confirm that our original function, function still works. Say we use um, say we use read CSV now with the first element of our parse. And we get all the information from there. And now it's time to do this with a map. So what we say is call it all datasets. We are using map from the Perl package on parse or over all parse. And we're using the function read underscore csv. And I'll open up the help page for map just for completeness. And afterwards, just let's display this so we can see what we did. Oh, there's a bunch of things happening. This is because all data sets is now a list of five elements, and each element is the data or one of the continents. But really, we wanted one big data frame or tip. So what we want to do now is take this list and combine it into one data frame using bind rows, which takes a bunch of data frames or a list of data frames. And now this should be one big data frame. Notice one last thing. <coughs> we are missing the information of which continent this came from, which is what we had in the original dataset. But now it's encoded in the names for our files. <coughs> so what we want to do is let's go back to where we created our paths. Copy this so and work with it again. And now we want to give names to this list. So we use the function names. Right now there shouldn't be any names. Yes. But we can assign to this the names we want. Um, and for this, we use the base name, which is the path without the folders leading up to it. <coughs> so just file name of the paths. Uh, but we, before we, pa we assign this to the names, I want to use string remove from the string R package. It's, it's also part of the tidyverse, and all the functions that handle text, they usually start with str string. And I want to remove um, .csv. I need to use these backslash characters these, to escape this dot, because otherwise it has the special meaning of being any character. But we want a literal dot to remove. And now, if I look at the parts, here are the names of our list. And we can also see this in the environment. Oh, I say list, but it's, it's actually a vector. It's just a normal vector. Just a vector with names. And now, if we go back to this part here, let me copy this here. 
that we have the data sets using now the new pass because we changed it here. And now I use bind rows on the data set. Uh, nothing happens because we need to give a name to the column that is generated from the names of our list. So we call this continent. And here we go. There's an even faster way of doing this because there are multiple types of map functions. It's just a, a whole family of functions. There's the regular map, which just takes a list and produces a list, which is nice because you can always be sure your input and your output must be lists. But if you want um, an atomic vector back, you can use one of these map underscore functions. For example, map character will always return a, te a text vector. Map double will return numbers. And what we want in this case is map DFR, which will return a data frame bound by rows, which is what the R stands for. So let me copy this here. And it basically does all this in one go. So we also need to give it the name for the ID column. And now I need to make sure I don't have the typo in here. And we are done. Just, well, one line of code and I'm set up. If we are feeling particularly fancy, we can even write this in just one chain of pipes. Let's do it. Just uh, Fun. So we want to get our gapminder variable. So we start using the directory with full names. And now we pipe this, so the names of our file the file paths, we pipe this to set names, which is Similar to assigning something to names, except we can do it in a pipe. And it can also take a function that processes the vector and turns it into names. So let's give it a function of x. So x will be the current value or name. We want to take x, we want to get the base name of x, and we want to remove the dot csv, so the literal dot csv. Oops, and now I accidentally stored everything in gapminder. So now I just stored the file path in here. What we actually want to do is pass this on to map underscore dfr. dfr, yeah. And so the first argument is already set using the pipe. We are piping the paths in there. So we only need to supply the second argument, which is the function to use, read underscore csv, and also this dot id thing to give it a give a name to the column for the names, which is continent. And now we have done this in just one go. There's another shortcut I want to show you, which is actually quite handy. Because notice how in here in set names we created a function and we just used it only once. This is what's called an anonymous function because we didn't give a name to it. So it's, it's like a no name function, just to, to use it only once because we need a function in here. And it's also called a lambda function from this concept that was developed quite a while ago. Or lambda calculus, from which um, some programming concepts originate. So these functions are also sometimes called lambda functions. And in R, well, we are not using a Greek keyboard, so we don't have a key for lambda. So the closest we can get is the tilde symbol. And this is why the per package allows us to create these anonymous functions with this shortcut using the tilde function. Let's demonstrate this by copying this. Instead of writing function of x here, 
Write its right. Tilde and Tilde automatically creates a function. However, we had no opportunity to give a name to give a name to the arguments. Up here we called it x. And in these anonymous lambda functions with tilde, the arguments are automatically called dot x. If we need more arguments, they are called dot y. And if we need even more, um, you can have a look at the help page for our map. <coughs> it is explained in here. For more arguments, we would use dot 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 one, dot 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 two, and three it, and so forth. Now this was all pretty con concise. There's another way to do this uh, using the imperative approach, <coughs> which is also um, very common in a lot of languages. So there you would use um, a construct called for loop. So in general, a for loop um, in R looks like this for, and then we have these round brackets for some variable name that we give it, let's say for i in um, some vector, like 1 to 10, for example, and now follows the body of the for loop in these curly braces. And now we do something with i, for example. We can, let's just print i. And if I run this, I should get the numbers from 1 to 10 in the console. So if we want to do the same thing that we did up here by using the function approach with map function, we would need to do quite a bit more work. First, we need to get this pass, which should be just this line here. And I mean path lower. And then what we also want is we need something to iterate all over. We don't just want to iterate over the numbers from 1 to 10. Um, and we need some way to store our results. So let's create an empty vector. And this vector needs to be of type list. And the length is just going to be the length of the path the variable. So if I run this, um, I just have an empty vector where it is null for every element. And now we iterate over this same, over the numbers from 1 to the length of the path. Now, here it would just print, oh yeah, that's um, unfortunate, I can't type. It's th. Now it just prints the numbers from 1. To five. However, what we want for each i, which is the index, this is where I call it i, we want to get the data from using read csv, and it should read from the pass at position i. Now, right now, nothing is happening, but the data variable should now be the last data set that we read in, which is, I guess, Oceania. This is Australia. But we overwrote data in every single iteration of the loop, which is kind of unfortunate. So we need to store this result somewhere, which is what we created this empty storage container for us. Um, so results at position i, double, uh, double square brackets, because it's a list. And in here, we store this data. We could have done this in one, one go. Actually, let's, let's do it in one go. Be a bit more fair. And now, let's look at the result afterwards. Oh, I used a plural, so it doesn't work. <clears throat> now it works. We have the same list that we had earlier. So now all that's left is this. Um, bind rows things. So we take the results and bind them together.
However, now we are missing the continent name again, so we need to set the names for the results to be the base name. Be the base name with um, CSV removed. Uh, that's it. And we could also well assign this to a variable and then use. Uh, notice one thing: um, this whole for loop thing is quite a lot of what people call boilerplate code. So code that is just there to make it work, not. Um, code that aids our understanding and aids our thinking about the data. Um, and the the map version of something usually focuses on what's happening. So we are mapping the function read CSV, whereas the for loop version of something usually focuses on this object, um, which is I. So if you have grasped this whole idea of maps, um, you can actually think about the problem in a more abstract way, and I think in a faster way. <clears throat> uh, that being said, if you can't think of a way to do this thing with map, it's absolutely okay to use a for loop. Um, but just keep in mind, of course someone has to write for loops, it doesn't have to be you. In general, if we contrast this functional approach versus the imperative approach. In functional programming, we tell the computer what we want. So we want a map from a file path to the, to, to the data, and the computer just does what we wanted. Whereas in the imperative approach, we need to tell the computer the individual steps. It's, it's more focused on um, the actual thing the computer needs to do. So we need to think more like a computer, whereas in the functional approach, we can think more like humans. For more information, you can also check out the Perl sheet sheet linked in the script. Along the concept of functions, there is this saying that if you copy and paste the same code more than three times, you should write a function. So let's use one example. So we already have the gapminder dataset now safely loaded after all the handling of files. So say we have this idea where the we filter the data for one particular country and then create a plot from it and also look how linear the whole relationship of life expectancy over time is. So we filter for Country being equal to, well, let's pick one country that we have in our data set, like Norway. And then we store this in a new variable, let's call it filtered. Um, filtered gapminder. And now what we want to do is produce a plot from it. So So we take the filter dataset, type it into ggplot, and we want the n on the x-axis and the life frequency on the y-axis, and we add some lines, and also some points. So this is what the data looks like for Norway. Maybe we also want to add some descriptions. Maybe we want to write yeah with a capital Y and have the full description for life expectancy on here. And then we want the title to also be Norway. And then we can also add a trend line using geom moose. Let's not forget this little plus here. And in geom smooth, which just adds a smooth line, we can choose different methods to do just that. 
For example, one method is LM, which stands for linear model. So let's add a linear model to it. To it. So we type method is LM. And then we get this trend line in here. At this point, a common question might be, well, how well does our data fit into this linear model? How linear is our original data? But unfortunately, ggplot, well, while it is able to produce these models and just plot them on there, it doesn't give us the full information back. So outside of ggplot, let's um, produce this model ourselves and then look deeper into it. So we can produce a model, let's call it model, because well, it is one, using the function lm for linear model. And lm takes a formula and some data. So as the formula, what we want is life, I think it's exp, dependent, this is the tilde symbol again, again dependent on year, where the data is the filtered gapminder. So let's look at this model. It just tells us the intercept, which is where the line crosses the y-axis, and the year, which is the slope of our line. Um, but actually, do the whole thing. So this is the slope of our line. However, there is one problem with all the modeling functions in R. They are all a tiny bit different. Because, well, R is quite an old language, like, like most programming language, languages, so it evolved over time, new things were added, and the modeling functions are all a bit different to use, depending on whether it's a linear model, a non-linear model, and all that stuff. But there's something very closely related to the tidyverse, which is the tidy models framework. We are not using the whole tidy models thing just yet, but we will use one library from the tidy models um, framework, which is the broom package. And broom helps us take all the outputs from these models, which are in different shapes, and just produce a tidy tibble from it. And we know how to work with tibbles. We have all the tools, so we're happy to work with tibbles. So there's a couple of functions we are using from the broom data, uh, from the broom package. The first one is actually called tidy. So we are taking this model and we are tidying it. And now it produces a tidy representation of what we just saw. So we get the estimate for the intercept and the year. We get some error message, um, some error estimations, some statistics on those. Um, we are not talking about those yet, but we will. We can also use the function augment on the model, which is quite handy. Take this model and the data it got in and produces the fitted value. So this is what the model predicts for each year. And we also get the residuals, which is the difference between what the model would predict. Actually, let's use um, this plot. So the residuals are the difference between what the model would predict and the actual values observed. And all for those, there's some more statistics. And last but not least, there's plants. We just want to take a quick glance at how our model performed. And we are using one of those. This is the output of plants. Um, we are using this R squared value in the next section. And R squared is a measurement which can take values between 0 and 1, and it tells us how, ve how, well, our, um, how well our data would be estimated by a straight line. So 1 would be a, would be a perfectly, perfectly straight line, or the values on there, and 0 would be um, numbers all over the place. So let's take our plot and enhance it with this R squared value. So I'm not using these for now. I just want this 
plants of the model. So from here we can get the R squared value using the familiar notation to just get a value from a table or a column of a table. And I want to add some text to it. So let's use the subtype title. And we could just, well, use this as the subtitle. But then we sort of lose information about what this is. So we could, we could write it somewhere else. Let's create this text out here. Let's call it text. And we can be a bit more sophisticated with our text. Let's um, show the actual R squared next to the value. And this is a bit tricky in R. I'm not a big fan of this part. Um, so if you you don't like this, you, you don't have to, to do this part. But what we can do is, instead of just using these values, uh, we use the substitute function, which takes an expression. So an expression like, for example, r squared equals equals, and then let's call it r sq for r squared. And it also takes an environment, which is where it searches for these things. So we need to create a list instead of an environment, which is which can work the same way. This r squared in this expression is actually equal to this thing. Um, and we can make it a bit prettier using whoops, the function round. So let's round two decimal places. So what this does is create this expression. And this expression is parsed, so R transforms it into this mathematical notation in here. If you want to find out what kind of mathematical notation you can use in the substitute thing, or using in, in general in expressions, you can check out the help for plot mass. And this describes the meaning of special characters and expressions for when you want to have mathematical notation in your plots. Now, of course, this was only for Norway, so we get curious and we want to know how this looks like for other countries. So, first instinct, we copy this thing. And now we change this, for example, to let's use another country, Mali, for example. And now everywhere we have where we have Norway, we need to change it to Mali, so in here as well. And now we get the same information for Mali, which um, fits the straight line pretty well. So within our rounding, it is <laughs> just the one. And now we want to do this for another country. Well, we copy and paste again, so forth. At some point we realize, okay, this is sort of a general trend. So I think we should create a function for it. So let's take all our code and see what changes and what stays the same. Well, for every country, only the name of the country in here and in here changes. So let's make this um, a variable. Let's call it name. So everywhere where we had country, the country name, we just write name. And let's put this in a function. Um, um, let's call it create country plot. And this is a function of the argument name. So just put this in here. And we can make this prettier by indenting it pr properly. So let's highlight this and press Control I to automatically fix our indentation. 
and now this function is defined so we can use it. For example, on the original Norway. And it works. Um, doing this in a function has another advantage. All these um, variables that we defined in here are now only defined locally in the function, so they don't float around and pollute our global environment. Um, everything we just need for, for the creation of this plot is sort of only there temporarily in this function, so we don't um, accidentally create a bunch of variables, for example. It only happens in the function, and we only get this output plot out here. At this point, you might also wonder where to put this function. So a good starting, uh, a good starting point is to just go to the top of uh, your document and just collect all the like general functions you wrote near the top. Th that way, it makes it easy to see. Okay, this is the packages we need, and this is all the functions we find. And then later on, your code becomes a lot more concise because all the complexity is sort of um, just moved to the top in these individual functions so you can understand your code more easily. Another way of doing this is well, let's take this function and instead of leaving it up here, we create a new R script. I have this R script in here, there's a function in here already. And let's add the one we just had, probably indent it. Don't say title one, okay. And now what we can do is source from this folder R this script. And what sourcing does is it just runs this whole script in the current session. This script doesn't produce any output, but it defines these two functions. So after having run this, uh, usually near the top of your document, because then you have the functions for the rest of your document, we can use them in our, in our document anywhere we like. And for example, the function say hello, defined in there, if we just run this, it says hello. I think it's, it's a good function name. And also the function create plot is available to us. The reason I call this folder R is because this is also the convention used in R packages. So if you want your code to be even more re reusable and maybe have some functions that are very helpful to others as well, you can create an R package from it and it's just one extra. So you can also check out the book about creating R packages linked in the script. Let's use this same technique to um, shine some more light on these linear trends. So for this, I will take the gapminer dataset and I will nest. I will nest the data and I will nest everything but the country and everything but the continent. Now we have the data for every country in this neat little list column. And then it gets pretty fancy. We will use mutate to create a new column. I call this column model. And now you probably see what's coming. We are using the map function to iterate over our data and apply this lambda function we are defining on the fly, which takes an argument that it will be called dot x, creates a linear model from it. The formula we are using is life expectancy depending on year, and the data is dot x. So the data will be each, like in each iteration, the data will be this table in here. And now we have a list column with models. Well, it would be quite, um, quite annoying to look into each individual model. So we are using the broom package to take a quick look into these models. Let's create a class of our model using map. And now we are iterating over the model column. 
and we are using from the Chrome package the function glance. And now we have this new list column, which is also a tibble. And this is nice because we know how to work with tibbles. And we also know how to work with nested tibbles. We can use the function unnest. And we unnest this clump column. And now we get a new column with all the values in this previous glance list column. For example, we get the R squared for all countries. So this is just the information compressed down into how linear the trend is. Uh, let's save this to a new variable um, and call it gapminder modeled. I just also put it down here. So we have it for future reference. In the final document, I would probably will, um, delete this line just so that it doesn't get too convoluted and we only display the most important outputs. But for now, I think it's really handy to have it here. What we can also do, maybe just do it in this step here, is arrange this by dot by r squared. And this has the advantages that we start with smallest r squared, so we already see what countries um, deviate the most from this linear trend. Get Rwanda, Ghana, Zimbabwe, Zambia. This whole run through is actually quite similar to what Hadley Wickham does in his book R for Data Science. The link again is in the script. And the chapter is called Many Models. So let's use this information to create a powerful visualization. We can create this. We can use the modeled data set and filter for all the countries where the R squared is, let's say, less than 0.2. OK, this looks good. And we can then unnest data as well. And now we have our original data back. Uh, let's call it non-linear countries. And let's create one nice visualization for today. And I usually like to use this opportunity to just introduce some more packages that you can use for data visualization so that you know there's more out there. And if you get curious, you might also look into these and maybe try them out. So um, first, Let's take our normal Gapminder dataset and start with ggplot using year and life expectancy root by country. And I mean group by in the sense that this determines how the lines will be connected that I'm now adding. It is a bit of a different group by than the group by and deployer, but it's, it has a similar meaning actually. So, geom line, and because those will be a lot of lines, um, let's make them a bit transparent. Okay, and now I will add some more lines, but this time, the data are just going to be the nonlinear countries. And they will get some additional aesthetics for them. I will set the color to the country. And let's also make them a bit thicker using size, let's say 1.5. And now the first package I want to introduce, it is called the Visualize package. And it has color scales derived from tropical fish. And we want the D variant for discrete. Let's just use the default fish with this bunch more. Now we want to add some labels or change some labels. So Y, correct label would be 
live expectancy at birth. Now I want to sort of get rid of this legend, but still retain the names for the countries. Now what we can do is first um, remove the legend using guides. And for the color, I want no guides, so I set guides to none. And now let's add sort of a legend ourselves, except right on the lines. What we could do is use geom geom text. Geom text needs another aesthetic, which is the label to use, and as the label, we will use the country. And now notice that we are plotting the country for every single point. So we also want to modify the data. So what we, we filter on only the nonlinear countries. And we filter for a year being equal to the maximum year. And I forgot a comma here. And now we only have the labels in here. We can also make them colorful. I think that should be a nice touch. So the color is also dependent on the country. Now one problem is <clears throat> they overlap quite a bit. So I want to introduce another package, which is the ggrepel package. So instead of using geom text, I use ggrepel. Geom text repel. And these labels will repel each other, so they will make space for each other. I also don't want them to move all over the place. I want them to repel mm, Yes, only in the y direction. And we can also make some more room for those, because right now they have to move quite a bit. Using expand limits, which is a function that allows us to say, okay, this plot um, value needs to be at least this big. For example, the x-axis, um, we want to include values up to 2015. Even though it's not in the data, it will just make room for it. And now we have some more space in here. And we can also make sure that our labels are not justified in the middle, but rather during the age just um, in on the left part of the text. So age just should be zero. Ah, uh, yes, this is looking much better. And we can also, now that we're at it, just add a theme, like theme minimal, for example. And now what I'm going to do, instead of displaying this plot straight away, I save it to a variable. Let's call it plt. It's a bit minimalist. Um, but we, we plan to use this plot a lot more, maybe give it a better name than I'm doing right now. But now so I'm assigning it to this variable and printing it straight away. But now we can also do more stuff with it. We could, for example, use ggsave on this um, Plot. But what I want to do instead is create an interactive version of this plot, which is the third li uh, library I'm introducing today. And this is the Plotly library. Plotly is a framework for interactive plots, but we don't even have to bother learning this Plotly framework because Plotly already has a function take a ggplot object and make it an interactive. And this is called ggplotly from the plotly package. We pass the plot to it. And now we get, well, first of all, we get a warning because this ggrepel geom is not implemented for ggplotly, which is fine. Because um, in this interactive version, we can just hover over the lines and it will tell us some information. This can sometimes be very handy to identify individual points just quickly. 
can also be really impressive to whoever is reading your report. Uh, let's take some time interpreting this plot. These um, downward doping lines starting about 1990, uh, these are the result of the um, AIDS pandemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. And these two dips in here, uh, Rwanda and Cambodia, um, these are the direct results of uh, genocides. And I am no expert on genocide, and it is, well, a much too serious topic to just depict with two dipping lines. But a friend of mine, uh, Timothy Williams, he is a researcher in the field of conflict and violence with a focus on genocides. He did field work in Cambodia and Rwanda, and I want to mention that his book, The Complexity of Evil, Perpetration and Genocide, uh, will be published on December 18 this year. So uh, check it out in the script. To end on a bit of a mm, less sad note, uh, let's check out one last advanced deep layer technique. And this is a function called a cross. So back on our GapMind dataset, Say we want to apply one function to multiple columns. We could do, um, let's say we want the continent to be uppercase. And we also want the same for the country. Now this works, now everybody is screaming, great. But this can be achieved way quicker. I'm introducing the cross function. As my neighbors are listening to music, I hope, it's, I hope it should be fine. Um, so the cross takes a set of columns, like for example, continent and country oops and yeah and in the cross function it also takes a function to apply so let's use this string to upper in here and now it does the same thing there are different ways of specifying which uh, columns to use for example we can also say okay we want all columns which contain text so where it's dot character. This is our all columns that contain text. And now we convert them all to uppercase. It also works in summarize. So we can use, say we want to summarize the column year to GDP per capita. So across the columns year to GDP per capita. We want to apply the function mean. And now we get a bunch of means. We can also give it a list of functions instead, but we need to make it a named list so we know how to name the new columns that will be created. So the mean, we call mean. And let's also create a total, call it sum. Um, let's calculate the sum and call it total. Now we get the mean of the year and the total of the year, why ever you would want to add years together. Um, but you can. So you are on your way of becoming a true data wizard. And after today, you should be familiar with importing data into R, the concept of tidy data, the grammar of graphics, the basic dplyr verbs for data wrangling, this whole project-based workflow, and also writing and using functions. So I look forward to seeing the exercises um, from you and I'll see you on Friday.